First of all, I'd like to thank you for all coming. A couple things I always talk about is technology with functionality. It's huge, okay? Precision demonstrating B mode, very important. Clinical understanding, not only of your patient's pathology, but of your machinery. What better patient care than understanding your machinery and its imaging parameters? Secondary imaging parameters, in many cases, as you're going to see today, made a big difference in treatment. And fortification of pretest probability with our patients. That's our number one concern. No matter how many years go by and we scan, we're as good as our QA, no matter what. This patient came to our ER with no pulses in their right arm. If we look at the first and second image, this is a acute arterial embolus. Our third image is secondary imaging with SMI, and you can see the delineation around the thrombus. Well, most physicians, what you're going to ask at this point is, where did this come from? Well, person then went for an echo. They found this. Person was stabilized and was set up for heart surgery. And a couple days later, two days later, person can't feel pulses in their right leg. Came back. This is what I found in the right popliteal artery. The person then had an embolectomy performed. After everything was done, with the heart surgery and everything, the person fared out well. So with applicability in the real world with ultrasound, we need precision B-mode imaging. We need color Doppler. And I really have a big emphasis on secondary imaging parameters. This is an internal carotid artery aneurysm. Pretty rare. Uh, I've seen about three in my life. So, Let's put a lot of this together and look at some interesting recent findings. A lot of these cases, I'll be honest with you, were done within the last month. Okay. How many people do visceral Doppler, interpret visceral Doppler? Well, one of the things with renal artery Doppler, I stress, is when you're looking at renal arteries, it's very important to look at the indirect assessment or the interparenchymal flow and the direct assessment, which is the renal artery. If you're in a radiology arena, Always utilize color if you see anything like a, quote, simple cyst. This person's history, this person's BUN is 50, and creatinine is 6, has endocarditis, and is 28 years old. So when we look at the B mode, it looks like a simple cyst, right? So put color on, thought immediately, I thought, okay, this looks like a pseudoaneurysm. Ask the patient didn't have any procedures done, didn't have anything, didn't have any secondary trauma or anything. So things weren't adding up. So looking at this, it's a beautiful image, color. Just by hitting a button with real time, we can see the color flow within this quote. What we thought was a pseudoaneurysm, or think is a pseudoaneurysm, I don't have time to show the Doppler interrogation, but this is the difference of SMI. You can see the fine delineation of the vessels, and there's turned out to be a mycotic renal artery aneurysm. It's very rare. This person thought they got stabilized, checked themselves out of the hospital, came back in the middle of the night, a month later, had a CTA, and this is the contralateral kidney. This was not there when we first did this a month ago. So they went and did a coiling of this. And this is what the ultrasound looks like. How many people interrogate upper extremity venous exams routinely? How many people look at the radial and ulnar veins? Most important question, how many people look where it hurts? Always look where it hurts. A lot of time incidental findings are more important than the initial exam ordered. Here's the case. Pat, you're not looking where it hurts. This is in the forearm. How long has this been pain been there? It's been six months. We sent the patient then for an MRI. And everything matched up. I went and put color flow, lowered my PRF and directional power Doppler. Still couldn't find any flow in this. I put microvascular flow on it, SMI, and what do we see? This turned out to be a sarcoma. This past Monday, our next patient came. 
And I'll show you a picture of this arm coming. This is gross cellulitis in an arm. Lymph nodes in her chest. And this was at her elbow. So one of my beliefs with any patient care, if you have secondary imaging, color, power doppler, SMI, show this to your reading physician. A lot of times diagnosis makes a big difference by what you're showing on the screen. Here is color. The second is directional power doppler. Remember I told you how bad that arm looked? Well, this picture underneath is where I'm inter interrogating on the top, but the picture underneath is SMI. And if we look at this in a big screen, you can see the differences in the additional component this added to this patient. Okay? Look at the microvascularization at skin surface. So again, show your reading physician something with three comparisons. Color, directional power Doppler, SMI. Makes a big difference, okay? How many people do visceral Doppler again? This is huge. This is very, very important. There's a lot of variance when you're looking at the celiac trunk and SMA. SMA. Um, the most common variant is you replace right hepatic artery. When I looked at this patient here, I've only seen this once or twice in my life. So I was looking at this, it was a conjoined trunk, I thought. The SMA coming right off the celiac. If you see this, it's very rare. Very rare. So I went ahead and looked, used color Doppler. This person was fasted. A fasting SMA should not have diastolic component, right? What are we seeing in this picture? Diastolic component. So, okay, we're thinking at this point, truly, it is coming off the celiac trunk. As I've been telling everybody all day, take your time, optimize your machine, understand your machine, and use your secondary imaging parameters. Here's a case where it made a huge difference. This is SMI. And if we look at this, see this compression with the red arrow here? This is significant median arcuate compression. And if we look at angiography, think about angiography in face of a significant lesion. What do we see after that lesion many times? post stenotic dilatation, right? Look at what happens after that lesion. See where those yellow arrows are? That's post stenotic dilatation. This person then went for the release procedure on the median arcuate and fared out very well. If I didn't use that imaging parameter, that person would have still been with a conjoined trunk. Little things in our examinations make big differences. This is just about two weeks ago. A person came in from South Carolina visiting their niece. A person had an endarterectomy two years ago. He said to me, you know, just two months ago, I finally healed up from the wound care center. I said, what happened? She said, I think they cut a cyst out of my neck. Didn't make sense. Person was diagnosed with a CVA. So if you're looking at the common carotid artery, what do we see at the common carotid artery? Something that shouldn't be there, right? So I'm looking at this, looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, that is not internal jugular vein. Let's go back to our history. Person had an endarterectomy two years ago and made this statement about being at a wound care center. You go to a wound care center because you can't heal, right? Can't heal infection. What this turned out to be was infection of the endart patch, thus pseudoaneurysm off the endart patch. Here's a look at SMI. If you want to look at this from a still aspect, you always want to look at pathology from two dimensions, okay? This is the sagittal depiction on top and the transverse depiction inferior. Color Doppler is very important. You can see the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. This is Doppler of it. It's not like a traditional pseudoaneurysm with the two fro component in the groin. This has an obliterative type of pattern like you're coming up on something, and you are. You're coming up on that infection and occlusion. And this is what it looks like real time. We're as good as our QA, as we all know, Person then was sent for a CTA. This is a problem at this point. This person's extension of this 
false aneurysm extends up to the level of the angle of the mandible, and the person had a short, fat neck, and it was down to the end of the clavicle. They're really concerned about this person, and they might have to disarticulate the jaw, and they're going to call in secondary specialists of Uni University of North Carolina as we speak on this. When something doesn't sound right, typically it isn't. No matter if you're a physician, if you're a manager sonographer, the longer you've been suing, doing something, if something doesn't sound right, it usually isn't. We're a national referral center. Uh, we do about 600 DVT a year. And this person got sent in from an outside facility to our specialist uh, to look at the solial DVT that couldn't heal, I mean, couldn't uh, resolve on Xarelto. So they came in. I was imaging this person and looking at this. This facility was about 40 to 50 miles away from our hospital. Well, I was looking at this and I'm thinking, doesn't make sense. Is that a solial vein? I want to go throw this out to everyone. This is a great secondary point. Uh, what's the number one mistake we make when we're looking at venous Doppler in the upper extremity? The brachial nerve, right? You think about the trajectory of the brachial nerve right next to here, right? So where's Pat going with this? Well, I'm talking lower extremity now, right? Well, this right here was not a solial thrombosis. Didn't make sense. I put color on, directional power Doppler, couldn't see anything. When I blow this up and look at this, you can see the internal vascular component within this. I knew what this was at this point, but the doctor ordered an MRI afterwards. This is a nerve sheath tumor. Okay? Remember this case. I've seen about four or five this year. Okay? Trajectory of the nerve is pretty much linear and never compresses. When you have veins, they have an endpoint. Okay? So think about something before you call it a solial thrombus or a posterior tibial vein thrombus. Posterior uh, tibial veins and perineal veins are duplicated. Okay? I'm going to end right there. And I'll encourage everyone, if you have any questions, I'm going to be around all day. I'll be in and out of the Sheba booth. Write your questions down, grab me, pull me aside. And if I can't answer these questions, guess what? I'll find someone that can. Thank you very much.